you've got an abscessed, deciduous first molar, and the woman is about 70 years old, and you can see the abscess right here. So we're extracting the tooth and bone grafting it. So first we're applying topical anesthetic, and this is a compounded anesthetic of lidocaine, prolocaine, and tetracaine. We apply that first, and it takes about 30 seconds or a minute to take effect, and then we spray it with hurricane topical spray. You can see it's benzocaine. We let that sit for a little while, and then I begin with a 30-gauge short and sit in this plane, which is pH neutral, so it doesn't sting. And then I follow that with a 27 gauge long and lidocaine 1 to 100,000 epinephrine. You can look at the videos in the Library of Dentistry Master Classes on how to give profound and painless local anesthesia. Now, a rubber dam is worth its weight in gold. I don't know what I would do if I didn't have a rubber dam, but I don't place it the conventional way. And I've had several people comment saying, well, this is not a good way because you're not placing a little strip between every tooth. Well, think about what this does. This is a long strip right here, so it isolates it very, very well. Maybe not exactly as well as placing the little strip between every tooth, but the little strip between every tooth is a pain in the rear. Because if you're doing anything interproximally, that little strip's going to get cut, so it ends up like this anyway. What does a rubber dam do? Well, the big thing it does, it keeps any big pieces of anything that you're cutting away. Like in this case, I'm cutting, removing that crown and cutting it into two or three pieces. I don't have to worry about one of those pieces of the crown being aspirated by the patient. The other thing it does, it keeps the lips and the tongue and the cheek out of the way. It makes your assistant's job and your job much easier and much less stressful. And this particular rubber dam method keeps the saliva off the tooth. With this technique, it only takes me about 15 to 20 seconds, maybe, to place the rubber dam. I use it for just about everything. Like in this case, I'm using it to extract that tooth. So learn how to use this rubber dam and let it be just a part of your everyday procedures and it will save you a lot of stress. The patient really likes it too because it keeps 99% of the water out of their mouth and they don't have to worry about a piece of something falling into their mouth and being aspirated. Okay, now when I'm extracting a tooth, I mark it. In 40 years, I've never taken out the wrong tooth, but don't even take a chance on being confused with what tooth you're removing. So I mark it with a magic marker and I have my assistant read the chart and say, Louisa, which tooth are we extracting? I don't prompt her. Before I put the mark on her, I, on it, I want her to tell me. It's especially true if you're extracting bicuspids for an orthodontist. You don't want to remove the second bicuspid if you're supposed to be taking out the first bicuspid. So quiz your assistant, Louisa, what does this request from the orthodontist say? And you, Louisa, mark this tooth with a magic marker to be sure you're reading it the same way I am. Then I mark it with a magic marker and you don't have to worry about it. You take that out of the equation, so be sure you've got the right tooth. Now, the intraligamental injection is so important if you want to completely anesthetize the tooth. I want that tooth to be like a piece of wood. I want it to be dead numb. I don't want the patient to be feeling anything. So in this case, I'm giving a mandibular block and I'm interligamentally anesthetizing the tooth after I've given the block. And watch the video on how to give painless and profound local anesthesia. Now, I'm giving the interligamental from both the lingual and the palatal side of the tooth. I don't want to take any chances on that tooth not being dead numb. So even though it's it's abscessed, I don't want to say, well, that tooth should be numb, it should be dead, and shouldn't feel anything anyway. I don't want to take any chances, so this doesn't take another 15 seconds. You don't want the patient to feel anything or they'll lose confidence in you. So I'm sectioning this zirconium crown, which I hate to do, don't you? It's like cutting through a shot put or a piece of flint. It's so hard. So this is just a coarse barrel diamond and light pressure. You don't want to press hard, just light pressure. And I'm cutting all the way through the crown. Now, I'm creating a space in approximately with this thinner coarse barrel diamond. 
and I'm creating a space between the tooth to be extracted and the adjacent teeth, so I've got a space to move the sectioned pieces into. If you don't have a place to move them and you section the tooth and you're trying to torque and move those pieces, they don't have anywhere to go. And so you're more likely to fracture a root. Again, just very light pressure. Zirconium is really hard on burrs and hard to cut through, but don't press hard. And lots of water. So I'm cutting here so when I torque that distal piece, it's got a place to move into. So I've cut through the crown. Now this piece of the crown did not move, and so I'm cutting through it mesial to distal, and I'm going to torque it this way. Now I'm taking this 330 carbide and making a little cut underneath the crown, and I'm going to put a elevator in that spot and just torque it up to remove that last piece. See, I'm just torquing that up. Okay, so there's that primary first molar, and this is a, about a number two long shank round burr, and I'm cutting through the entire tooth from facial to lingual past into the furcation. You want to be sure to cut all the way through if you can, because you know these roots on primary teeth are brittle anyway, and they're small, so be sure to cut all the way through if you can. I'm going to elevate this flap so I can visualize the alveolar crest, and the other thing is I'm going to graft this socket for socket preservation, and I'm going to place a resorbable collagen membrane over the graft. So I want to tuck that graft under the flap on the facial and the lingual, so you need to elevate it just a little bit. Keep it in attached gingiva if you can. Don't elevate all of the attached gingiva, but just elevate it a bit on both sides. Now remember, if you're using a high-speed handpiece to section a tooth, you never want to elevate the flap, especially on the lingual, past the attached gingiva. You want to leave a significant portion of the attached gingiva in place so you don't get an air embolism. I've never gotten an air embolism in 40 years of practice, but if you elevate the flap, on, especially on the lingual, such that you've elevated all of the attached keratinized gingiva down to the unattached non-keratinized, that's when you get an air embolism using a high-speed handpiece. So don't do that. I just want to visualize the alveolar crest on both sides. Removing primary molar teeth is always complicated because the roots tend to fracture. You want to try to elevate it if you can. Elevate the roots. It's especially difficult if you're trying to elevate and you've got crowns on the adjacent teeth. There's a fair chance you're going to lift one of those crowns off. So you're better off torquing this direction on the mesial root and this direction on the distal root. So that would be counterclockwise on the distal root and clockwise on the mesial. If you torque the other way, this way on the mesial and this way on the distal, that's when you're more likely to lift the adjacent crown off the teeth. So now I'm trying to just unscrew this root, which is difficult with primary teeth. But you want, I want to preserve the facial and the lingual bone. So I'm just putting minimum pressure and trying to lift it straight out of there. I'd rather do most of my loosening by elevating the roots mesial and distal. Now there we have it. And then I'm going to cure it out, that granulation tissue. This is just a large spoon. You can see the granulation tissue. Get that nice and clean. You don't have to worry about the inferior alveolar nerve when you're extracting this primary tooth because the nerve is not at the bottom of the sulcus. Now this is, is freeze-dried, mineralized, demineralized bone. I've tried many things with bone grafting, Maxius, Bioas, and platelet-rich fibrin. I've found that probably the very best is platelet-rich fibrin. The problem with platelet-rich fibrin is finding a vein on a patient to draw the blood from because you really can't draw it from the hand. You need a larger vein which is up in the antecubital fossa. So sometimes that's an issue and when that's an issue you sometimes have to go with mineralized, demineralized, freeze-dried bone which is the case here. Just drying that off. So this is cortical, cortical bone 
and I'm going to let this heal for six months once I graft it. Now, what I find is at the end of six months, if I use these particulate bone, at the end of six months, there's still some particles in the graft. With plate-rich fibrin, there are, it's, it's solid. You know, there's nothing there but just solid bone. So it's, it seems like the, the implant still works well, even with the, uh, the freeze-dried bone but it seems to be the best with platelet-rich fiber. Now, this is a resorbable collagen membrane. The reason you place a resorbable collagen membrane over the graft is you're isolating the graft from the soft tissue. The soft tissue grows faster than bone, and so the resorbable collagen membrane gives the bone about a three-month head start on the soft tissue. You don't want the, the socket to fill with soft tissue. You want it to fill with bone. And so the patient's own bone is going to replace the bone, the artificial bone, in the socket. That's what you want. So this resorbable collagen membrane covering the graft, remember we're going to tuck it under the flap on the facial and under the flap on the lingual, gives that bone about a three-month head start on the soft tissue because this will resorb in about three months. See, I'm placing it over the graft and then tucking it under the flap on the facial and the lingual. I'm, uh, the flap is still connected. It's, the, it's still in keratinized gingiva. It's still connected to the alveolar crest, but it's just reflected a bit so I can tuck that membrane underneath it. And this is 3-0 gut, plain gut suture. It'll dissolve in three to seven days. And you don't suture it. You don't blanch the tissue because you don't want it to pull through. You just want, want, you just want it to be snug. And I'll place three sutures. Now, this is a key point with suturing. Once you place the suture through and you're tying it, you go one, two, three away from you, one towards you, and then one wrap away from you. If you just go one, two away from you, that won't be snug many times. It'll loosen. But if you go one, two, three, and you have to keep the suture rather taut as you do that, and then one, and then one, that's really tight. And try to place the knot on the side of the incision. Don't place it right over the extraction site because it'll accumulate food debris and plaque. You don't have to have primary closure. And that's especially true if you're using platelet-rich fibrin for the graft. Sure, it's nice and snug. Ever bite on a two by two? There's a graph. That's the dental minute. These techniques work and they work every time. I know you want to take your practice to the top tier. Subscribe to DentistryMasterclasses.com for an organized library of all the Dental Minute videos, plus many complete comprehensive cases and many very important articles that you can only find right here. New cases are added weekly and it's only $20 a month. Subscribe now.